Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the OTF Webinars uh, Connect Sessions. Tonight we have returning Lisa and Floyd. This time we're plotting an engaging lesson in math through coding using coordinate grids. Really looking forward to this one. Um, this webinar will be recorded for you folks, and uh, I'm not going to say too much because we want to get going. I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Have a great evening, folks. I'll be in the chat. Okay, here I am. Thank you, Trish, for the intro and for moderating this webinar tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, and as always, I'm pretty excited about being here as I really just love this stuff. I'll be sharing some new material tonight um, that I've been sharing for the first time, actually, and also sharing a few things that I've made and tried out with students and teachers in the past. Hopefully, we won't have too many bugs with the new stuff. I did try a new computer tonight, and that didn't go so well. Um, but hopefully, from here on out, we're um, going to be in the clear. Now, if you have any questions throughout, please let me know in the chat window, and I'll try to respond um, accordingly. If I miss any questions, you can just send me an email later, or um, I'll try and ask again in the, in the chat window, and I'll try and address those for you. So as it says here, I'm working with Fair Chance Learning right now, supporting school boards um, with professional learning related to coding and computational thinking, mostly in Ontario, but also around Canada. And I actually had the privilege to work with a group of K-8 educators and students at a session today in Brantford. And I saw a couple of names on there. I saw Jen, who was organizing it, and Lisa as well. And um, I'm always uh, leaving those sessions feeling even more inspired. Um, I really believe in what I do, and I get to share my passion for this amazing um, stuff that I, I think is just really beneficial for our students to be doing. Um, I also especially love when students and teachers remix ideas that I share and make them so much better. So if there's anything that I share tonight that you end up using, I'd love to hear how it goes via email or on Twitter, especially if you have ideas about how to make it better, because then I can share it with others. Um, I also have the great honor, so um, I work with Fair Chance Learning, but I also have the great honor to teach pre-service teachers a computational thinking in math and science course at Western University. And um, there we learn about how to integrate coding and programmable devices into the classroom. I recently completed my master's in math education this past summer, and the, in the process I've had the opportunity to learn from profs to focus on computational thinking and to also help out as a research assistant at Western and Laurier. So I love reading the latest articles and research on uh, computational thinking, and I try to keep up to date with that. Finally, before I get started, I just wanted to mention a TVO Teach Ontario Coding and Computational Thinking Hub, it's a bit of a mouthful, uh, that my husband Stephen Floyd and I have been working on. So it's just another place for all of us Ontario educators to collaborate. And um, I'll share a link tonight um, of an article from there um, that we just actually posted last week and for the Olympics. So I thought, I know we did a couple polls already, um, but I thought when we get started here, we can try out this poll. Perhaps you can indicate in the chat window or with one of your, um, I forget what Trish called them, but uh, emoticons, and throw them on. OK, and some people know how to use the, the poll option. Awesome. So I see some people work in many different areas. OK, so a couple K to 3. Hopefully tonight you'll find something that you can maybe use um, with your students. It's a little bit more geared to, towards 4 to 8, uh, to be honest. But of course, it's always great to know where your students can take this stuff. Okay, so it seems like we have a lot of junior and more than one. Okay, thank you for sharing. And even our French and Morgan, thank you. Awesome. And I'm assuming you know these that you can program Scratch in French as well. We can change the language. Wonderful. Okay, thank you for sharing. We're going to move on to, I just want to talk quickly about coordinate systems. So normally I start these webinars talking about coding and what computational thinking is. But I figure if you want to hear about that, you can go watch one of the others, because they all are all posted on the OTF website. And I'm just going to get right into the math and coding part tonight. Um, so because we're talking about coordinate systems, 
thought I would just mention the different types of coordinate systems um, that you might not even realize were actually considered coordinate systems. So the simplest example um, would be the, the number line. And so the Cartesian plane is one of the many types of coordinate systems out there, um, but the simplest one is the number line. So another one would be the polar coordinate system, and that's when we're talking about how far away something is and then using the angle as well. So that's used for a different purpose. We don't tend to use that very often um, in elementary school anyway at all. And then we've got curvilinear or coordinate systems, just a much more complex one. And you can even design your own custom coordinate system. The one we're going to focus on tonight, though, is the Cartesian uh, system. So this is what most of us think of when we hear the term coordinate system. And we can use it in two dimensions, as we typically do um, in elementary school. So we've got the two perpendicular lines, the x and y. Or we can have it in three dimensions as well with the three perpendicular lines. So just a side note, um, something I notice when my students come to me in grade 9 is they have a bit of a misconception. They, they have trouble with their units. So when they're working in one-dimensional space and they're measuring me measurements such as length or width, uh, that would be in centimeters. And then if they're going to be doing 2D shapes, so two dimensions, then it would be centimeters squared. And so that two, they can think of it as two dimensions. Then when we add that third dimension, when we look at height and we're working with the X, Y, Z coordinate system, then we've got centimeters cubed. So I try to remind them that's when we're working in 3D. And it's kind of nice because they're used to watching these 3D movies now and it makes a little bit more sense to them when you've got depth. You can talk about three dimensions. So then we've got um, this guy <laughs> um, that you might have heard of, and his name is Descartes, uh, René Descartes. And he is a French philosopher and a mathematician. So there's a legend about this guy who is um, credited with coming up with the Cartesian plane, although it's been used, it was used by others. Um, but he was often sick in bed. And so he would stare at the ceiling for hours. And there happened to be a grid-like panel on his ceiling. And one day, he noticed a fly buzzing around. And so he realized that if he used, so he was like looking at the fly and kind of thinking about where it was located on the ceiling. But he realized if he used two perpendicular lines in everyday life, then he'd be better able to describe the position of different um, objects or flies on the ceiling. And he'd be able to tell people where exactly uh, the fly is. And so that's how he, the legend is anyway, he started using the Cartesian plane in real life. So there is a storybook, uh, which is always wonderful when you can integrate literacy into your math classes. And it's called The Fly on the Ceiling. So I'm not sure if anyone has read this book or has used it with their classes already. Uh, but you can see that Shish has given you a link. Um, so I thought I'd give you a moment to just check out that link. Um, the bit.ly there, link there, it's fly on wall story. And it will take you to a YouTube video, and it has somebody reading a story. So I'll just give you a moment to check that out. And while you're doing that, I'll also mention that I just did a quick Google search to find the fly on the ceiling on Amazon.ca, and it's only um, a few dollars. So if you want to purchase it um, for your school, you could do that as well. Oh, and thanks, Trish has posted that link on there too. So just check out the first link right now, if you don't mind, to see the YouTube video. And then if you're interested in purchasing it, um, I just found the link. <laughs> I don't get commissioned just for it, so you know, but I thought I would help you out by finding that. So I'll give you, um, it's about a six minute video, but I'll give you um, two minutes to have a look at that.
Okay, hopefully I've given you enough time to check it out a little bit and to get an idea of what the story is about. It's fairly long, um, but it's kind of neat to introduce the Cartesian plane, I think, with a, with a storybook. And if anyone has any other books that you have read that are, that are related to coordinate system and the Cartesian plane, I'd love for you to type it in the chat window so the rest of us can check those, on out, those ones out as well. So when we do coordinate planes or any subject I do in math, I try and um, at least a few times a week, have some sort of song. Um, and even when it means the students are groaning because it's uh, not the best song, uh, I still believe that there's value in them hearing it because it helps them to retain that knowledge and to, re to remember how to, for example, um, that X comes first when you're using an XY coordinate system when you're plotting points. And so this one here, is a, another link for you, thank you Trish, uh, bit.ly slash ordered pair song. And I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to check that out because I, I think it's worth um, showing songs like this as either an intro to class or a mind's on um, or as students are eating lunch, you can bug them with playing songs like this during their lunch. Awesome. I love that timer. Okay, so now we've got um, the Cartesian plane here, talking a little bit more about it. So in order for students to make sense of graphs and algebraic functions, where they're eventually going to get to in high school and in, you know, grade eight, they first need to develop a fluency of Cartesian plane. But before that, they actually have to understand how to use number lines. So you have to keep in mind that what you're doing now is preparing your students for algebra in the future. So here um, we're talking about progression. So Ernest um, uh, recommends that we start off with number lines and then move on to the Cartesian plane. And then once they finally feel, um, you feel confident that they understand the Cartesian plane, they then move on to functions. And so we have to make sure that we get rid of all those misconceptions and preconceptions and hopefully and have a, that students have a clear understanding of how number lines work. So some of the issues that we see with coordinate grids are the students find it boring. <laughs> That's one of the first things you see when you look at this up. Um, they have trouble understanding the intervals of the axes. And so, you know, for example, if you have your x-axis with different intervals and your y-axis with um, going up by a different value, that confuses students sometimes. Also, dimension may be firmly rooted in geometry, but it's actually not well understood by students, and even at the college level, that's what the research shows. Um, and finally, one that we're all familiar with, the most common problem is that the coordinates, uh, the order of the coordinates um, is also often mixed up. So they'll list the Y first or the X um, and, and the X second, which obviously they're going to get their points mixed up there. So what can we do to deal with some of these misconceptions? Well, um, I think here I'm just going to give a few unplugged activity ideas, and I'm sure many of you have some amazing ideas that you've used already with your students. Um, so we're keeping all of what I just mentioned in mind, some of the issues that students have with Cartesian play, and considering some of the things that we can do um, to deal with those issues. So here are my suggestions. Um, first of all, you might do a human number line activity, which I've seen done. So you can give students um, little pieces of paper as they're coming into class one day uh, of integers or real numbers, um, and then they have to get themselves in that order. So you could have them um, you know, look at the number, then put them in their pocket, and then have to get an order of the numbers without talking. So they have to, you know, just use hand gestures. Or another way to, to do that number line is to give the students expressions, and then they have to answer them first. So for example, one student might get negative 3 plus 2 and end up with negative 1. So they have to answer, and they know that they are negative 1, and they would have to get that in that position on the number line. So it helps if you indicate to the students where they would stand on the number line. You know, you could say um, the negative side is towards the left down the hall. It's always great if you can go to the hallway or outside for this sort of thing. Uh, another way to do this is you can include fractions and have students line up 
um, proportionately. So, for example, if you're in the hall, again, this would be back in the hallway or outside. So, if you're using zero decimal one or one tenth, one five and one hundred, one hundred would be way over down the hallway, and zero point one compared to one also um, means that they're going to be standing further apart. So, it just gets the students um, used to the idea that um, numbers have different values. So that helps you to understand um, the intervals on the number line. Finally, once you have them in the number line, and it's an, you don't want to miss this opportunity to fold that line, and then you can have the students pair up in this way. So it's an opportunity for community building. And I credit um, Trish Loney, who is with the Thames Valley District School Board. She helps me to understand that community building is so important in my math class and that it's worth spending the time doing it because in the end the students will um, produce better results and have a better understanding when they're comfortable in sharing um, with one another. They'll also realize it's a comfortable and safe place to fail. So you might have them pair up by, so you fold the line and have them say something they did this weekend that they enjoyed, something that they didn't like that weekend. Give them a chance to vent a little bit uh, and then you can always tell them who goes first. The person between the two with the closest birthday to January can go first and then switch and then they, the one line shifts over, one person goes to the other end and then you just continue doing this as many times as you like depending on how much time you have in your class. So another Good idea. I, I try to, every math class, get students up and moving. Um, and one way to do that is to have number lines on your floor with tape. Uh, you can have them um, go to the gym and you can just shout out <laughs> positive or negative numbers. So if you're using negative and positive numbers, you'll have them having to shift back and forth fairly quickly. Uh, so that gets them up and moving. Uh, also, Lego number lines are kind of neat, so they're actually having to move the characters and counting as they go, so they don't just um, skip over something accidentally with their finger. Uh, double number lines is something I haven't used, but I noticed they're great for proportional reasoning, so just something else that you might want to try out so you can investigate that further later if you haven't used them. But um, it really is just awesome to give students um, an opportunity to get up and move around. I know every student is different. If I think about my own three children, uh, my middle son needs to move around or else he gets kind of cranky. Um, and the other two have different needs throughout the day. So for those students who need to get up and moving, it's just a great opportunity, especially in math class. They don't expect that either. Uh, so by getting them up and moving and actually feeling the um, the number lines, um, it kind of goes along the lines of Barbara Kanash's research. And she says, in order for students to understand math ideas, they must first be able to make sense of the world through visualization. So this gives you an opportunity to help them to visualize what's happening on the number line. Uh, another great idea is to have number lines that are missing numbers. Because when we give students axes on a graph, they're often missing some of the numbers, and you need to get them used to being able to label them. Uh, it is especially good to have them using number lines with different intervals, so not always going up by one, sometimes going up by five, sometimes one thousand, as you see here, or um, up by two thousand, and then get them filling in those missing numbers, because that's something that they struggle with um, when labeling axes. So this is before you even move to two dimensions. You're, you can work on this and help them improve how they fill out the axis. Of course, another um, idea is to just move your number lines and put them vertically on the page so they get used to going up and down rather than just left to right. Just a simple tweak that could make a difference for having your students understand. And stairs, oh, great idea, stairs. <laughs> Love it, thank you. So moving on, um, grids outside is a great idea. Now this is not a really great picture. I couldn't really find any images to show you, but I was envisioning just, you know, have zero, zero somewhere in the middle of a football field or somewhere in the middle of wherever on a field outside and then just shedding out numbers. So if you're just working in the first quadrant, in the positive quadrant, you can just yell, you know, one, five, and students have to, you know, shift to the right and then go up five. And um, you can shout out various numbers, and of course I would try and say things like, you know, negative 100 plus 100, and they should use, um, have an idea that maybe every step would be equal to um, a shift on the axis. So when you're plotting points on paper, it's 
awesome if you can somehow give your students some context. So anytime you're having them plot points, if you can have them get the data themselves or collect it themselves, it's going to be more meaningful when they go to do it. So if you can get some cheap thermometers, um, you can have students plot real data that they've actually collected. Um, or you could even go on to um, on to Stats Canada's website or there's other websites that have live data. So I noticed one day that you can check the temperature of one of the boys in great, the Great Lakes. So um, for example, Lake Superior, you can check to see what the temperature is and you can check it every half an hour or every hour and have your students record that information um, throughout the day one day and then maybe the next day they go ahead and they plot this on a graph. So you can start at um, time zero and then go up by maybe one hour, two hours um, in the summer months. It's kind of nice because the temperature will likely go up throughout the day and then they can talk about that. I'm sure many of you have your own favorite sources of, of data, um, so it's also whatever you can use. I think to have them plot real data is so much more valuable than just plotting random points around. So just before we get into the hands-on applications here, uh, talk briefly about the research and why we should why why um, the research shows that we should be using coding for math learning. So um, Papert saw Logo as both a coding and mathematics environment, and I'll talk about that in a moment. That was actually for something later, but I'm ahead of myself here. But um, you have to keep in mind that our students are born into a digital environment, and so um, you know it's a natural fit to actually have them using digital environments for the um, for plotting points. Now, dynamic software provides teachers with an opportunity to replace um, transmissive teaching with a constructivistic um, of method to a greater extent. And so coding is considered to be dynamic because you get immediate um, feedback and you can change the, the values throughout the program. So that's another reason why um, it's recommended to use coding or some of um, GeoGebra or some of those other programs that you can use. Um, okay, so the goal of math education today is to think mathematically. And what we see now is with computer software, you're able to understand things more quickly. You'll see uh, representations much faster than, than the way it used to be. And it also helps us to visualize data. Um, so dynamic software or, or programs that change and, and show changes as we're going um, definitely has benefits for our students and they can also begin to be a little bit more creative because they have the time to do so if they're not spending time plotting every um, point with a pencil and paper, which there is value in doing that for sure, um, but having that interactive opportunity is wonderful as well. So. Um, you can see here, I talked about Seymour Papert, and he wrote a book called Mindstorms over 30 years ago. If you haven't checked it out, I definitely recommend it. Um, but he considered this programming language called Logo. Now, we're going to be using a programming language tonight called Scratch, which many of you have probably used already. Um, if not, no worries. I'll give you some links so you can check it out. But um, Logo was sort of a precursor to Scratch. And it and it's a learning language. And Papert considered it um, an environment where you can learn coding and math. And you might have heard the term mathlands. And he and he says that um, coding in math class is sort of like learning French in France. Uh, so it's a kind of a neat um, analogy. So coding can be used to model and investigate mathematical relationships. So Dr. George Gaunidis of Western University. Um, is, I've learned a lot from him, and he has a lot of resources online freely available. Um, he has a website called imaginethis.ca. And um, he believes that coding can be used to enhance student understanding of math ideas. And hopefully we'll see a little bit of that tonight, and many of you have probably done it already. I see a little discussion on logo in the chat window. Awesome. So my last piece of research for you is from a book called Coding for Young Mathematicians. And um, Dr. Gadaninas again talks about this idea of um, being able to represent math dynamically. And again, you see those changes immediately. And also the students are put in control. So there's some value in that. And they, they feel like it's a little bit more authentic and they appreciate being in control of their learning when they're coding in math class. So something to keep in mind 
um, as well is that, you know, coding is, is new to many of us. And we should take this leap for sure if, if you haven't been doing so already. But do so knowing that there's so many resources of support out there. We know that it's the right thing to do. The research tells us we, many of us who have done it have seen it and um, appreciate it. Um, and but school districts do, I believe, need to support our teachers with this idea um, if we're expecting our teachers to do it. Or perhaps you can attend things like this, like this webinar tonight. And we have, appreciate that OTF gives us this opportunity to share some ideas around coding and computational thinking. Um, and today, I also hope that you'll see some of the possibilities. So we know that it, coding is good, but it's also hard to teach something new. And it also introduces new variables, like literally, because you can make variables when you're coding in scratch. Um, but because it introduces other more complicated concepts sometimes. So we do have to keep that in mind. Kind of like a warning, I guess, or something to bear in mind. So before we get into our hands-on applications and some ideas for you to try out, I just wanted to have a quick poll. So you can fill that out either using the poll letters at the top, I see some of you have already, or just indicating with the um, happy faces or however you'd like to let us know. Okay. Okay, so I see a lot of some and a couple considerable and a little limited. So hopefully with the applications that I'm going to share with you tonight, um, you will feel comfortable and they're low floor, meaning multiple ver um, levels of readiness and also high ceiling, meaning you can extend them um, for yourself or for your students. So thanks for taking the time to fill that out. So for the first one, um, I would love it if you can go to this link. Uh, I will share my screen um, just to give, give you some ideas for this program. Um, so you can see the, the link has been conveniently posted um, within the chat window. So you can just click on it. And I'm going to go ahead and try sharing my screen. And um, we'll try this together. Okay, so I think it looks a little small for you guys. Maybe you can make it bigger. I'm not sure if you have control over your own um, window, but I can still see the chat window, so if you have any questions, you can type them in. Uh, and you can see now you have the Canada map. And this was sort of inspired by um, something that Ryan Smith of a board just north of Toronto shared. Um, but for this one, I'm having you use code to plot the little Canadian beaver. Can you see him right now? He's in Ontario right now. Um, and your, your goal is to use the glide block that you see on the bottom here. So you can see my cursor on top of the glide block right now. And just beneath it, it says Quebec. So the code on the green flag area right now says go to negative 200, negative 150, which is actually the bottom left of the screen. So if you hold your mouse on any point of the stage, which is where the map is located right now, um, you'll be able to see the coordinates um, indicated for you um, just in the bottom right near the map. So I think you can see my cursor there. And so right now, I've done the first one for you. It says, um, so when I click the green flag to run, and you can click it now. It won't affect my program. You can change it however you'd like. When you click the green flag, I'll say, welcome to the Canada um, plotting plotting on Canada exercise. And then he's going to glide to Ontario, which you can see in my code. I indicate 30 and negative 100. And then I say the word Ontario for three seconds. So your job is to duplicate multiple blocks and to plot on other provinces. So I thought we would take the time to plot maybe on Quebec and um, at least one other province right now. So in order to have your script run, you have to drag the blocks up. So you can see I'm going to drag the Quebec block up. And then when I run my program, it will do the first 
speech bubble, moves over, glides over to Ontario, which is located at 30, negative 100, and then glides over to Quebec, which is located at 101, negative 70. And your job is to duplicate those blocks and make others. So you can get the glide blocks either by going to motion and then look, or um, now it depends what web browser you, you are using, but if you click on right click and duplicate, you might have that option to do so. If you do not have the option to do so, you can hold down the shift key and left click and then you'll get that duplicate option. So now I've got a couple blocks ready to go and I can change the name. So instead of Quebec, perhaps you're going to do Alberta. And then you'll also have to change the coordinates for Alberta in order to move the Canadian beaver to Alberta. So I'll give you an opportunity to try that now. Now at the top right of your screen, you'll probably see or you should see a remix button. If you're logged into Scratch, you can click on that. If you're not, don't worry. At the end of the webinar, um, we have a Google Sheet with all of the links to the programs and you can give them to your students and have them play around with them. So you don't have to keep track of the links that um, Trisha and I are giving you tonight. At the end, you'll have access to them. So you can change the coordinates for the Alberta and you'll notice if you hold your cursor once again, it will say where to find it. So I'm going to change it to negative 140, negative 43 for me. Might be slightly different for you. An extension of this would be, you know, can they do the bodies of water? And there's all kinds of different things that, that you can have them plot. And yes, for this one, we are doing um, the negative numbers. So we're kind of doing it more for grade 7, 8. Um, but I think it's still beneficial to do this with the younger Canada. So the map of Canada, um, I got it just from online. So if you look at the stage, um, as Elizabeth on the, the left hand side, you can go to um, where it says new backdrop, just below it says up, upload backdrop from file. And you can um, have a picture saved from the internet, from images, and then just um, upload it there. So that's how you can do it. So you can choose any image that you want to for this. And maybe even choose an image that ends up with um, maybe the, the country or the province or the city in the top right quadrant, so then that way you can stick with the positive numbers. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I'm going to return back um, to I have to do this. There we go. To my slides, so you can see what we're going to do next. There we go. Okay, so there's another one that you get to, to try out now. And it's um, just a simple one. And I thought I would show you this. So you can go ahead and click on the link. Thanks, Trish. And then when you get to that link, it'll have um, some, some dots <laughs> on the Cartesian plane. And the Cartesian plane, um, you can go ahead and click on it if you'd like to. You can get the Cartesian plane from New Backdrop. It's the third last one, that one there. Uh, and then your goal, as you can see, I've added a comment um, that says, um, can you stamp scratch onto the color, each colored circle by using the go to and stamp block. And then once the students do that, um, you can then have them um, challenge them. And so if you have these instructions in the comment window, they just go ahead and do them. Uh, I've tried this, this one here, I've done quite often. I've never done the Canva one yet with a group, but um, this one I've done quite often. And then the students will choose three points themselves with a little bit more open-ended inside of that rectangle. One thing that you might say to your students is, can you plot them in order of the colors of the rainbow, so red, orange, yellow, um, just to give them a little bit of guidance. So I'll let you play around with that one and let me know if you have any questions. So again, whatever you do to this, it won't affect mine. Um, and you can play around with it and mess around however you'd like. You'll notice that I have a wait block as well. And that's just so when you click the green flag, so you'll click the green flag to run the program, you'll then see um, where Scratch moves to, the little cat moves to. It'll leave a stamp of itself on each spot, and then um, you'll be able to see how you've done. Now, if you need to clear the screen, I just, you can see that I use the when space key press block. Hopefully you can see that on your screen. 
So just hit the space bar and that will delete all of the stamps of the scratch character. If your students get through that fairly quickly, then what I've done is I've said, okay, can you move all of those points to a different quadrant? And then they'll take the time to do that. And many of them will, will do so successfully, even if they haven't done negative numbers. So even in the um, junior grades, they'll start to do that. So hopefully that gives you enough time to check it out. Don't want to go too quickly here. So I have another challenge um, that I've used before, and actually a couple of people I think on here have seen um, this. I'm going to, so if you just have a look at my slides, you can see my next challenge is coding your initials. So your goal here, you now you can stick with the positive quadrant if you want to. You can see the one that I'm giving you, I'm starting in the quadrant two. So your goal then would be ha to have your students code their initials, maybe their middle names as well, um, one letter in each quadrant. You could also do your school name, um, the letters for your school name, one letter each quadrant. So um, for this one here, it's, it's bit.ly, thank you, Trish, um, slash plotting initials. And for this one, I'm going to share my screen um, just to help you out a little bit with it. So you can go ahead and, and click on the points and I'll share my screen in case you'd like to keep an eye on mine at the same time. So what you'll see, or what you've noticed already, is I'm giving you links to programs that have already started. And sometimes it's nice, um, pardon the pun, but you don't want to always start from scratch uh, because it can be a little bit overwhelming and you also want to be able to make sure you're spending time focusing on the math and um, if you're doing math class. Now notice how I made my code a little bit bigger for you to see and I used the, the minus and the plus in the bottom right hand corner. So if you click the green flag, you've probably already noticed that the code that I have makes the N. Uh, in between, uh, you might realize that you have to use the pen up um, block, which is found under pen. So if you if you want to code your next initial, you can go to pen up. Then you'll need to use the go to block again, just like I have, to move to a different point. and you'll have to remember to put your pen back down again. This one is kind of addicting. I find people get really determined to figure out how they can code their initials, and they spend quite a bit of time on it. So I'll just remind you that you can duplicate your blocks, and depending on your browser, you might be able to right-click if you happen to be in Chrome, like I have. If not, no problem. You can hold down the Shift key and left-click, so regular click if you'd like to. And again, I can see the chat window, so if you have any questions, just let me know. So Elizabeth has a question. Would lines of symmetry with letters in different quadrants be something that would make sense? So do you mean, could you draw um, like a capital N and then do like a reflection in the other side? Or what, I'm not quite sure what you mean there. But I've known, I've seen people do some amazing work with symmetry in coding. Um, Dr. George Gadanidis in particular has done that. Um, and you can see some of his work on imagine this dot I'll actually type that in too. Thanks, Trish. It moved up a little. So, so imagine this dot CA is somewhere where you can um, have a look at some of oh I think I spelled it wrong. <laughs> imagine this of his work. There we go. Um, 
But anyway, yeah, so he's done a lot with symmetry. I will, in a, more, um, a little, bit, little bit later on, show you how you can do a reflection um, by plotting points um, on over the x-axis and over the y-axis. So maybe that will inspire you a little bit. But for certain, pretty much anything you ever ask about math and coding, it usually makes sense. Sometimes it's just a little tricky, that's all. Okay, so I'm wondering if anyone was successful. I'd love to know if anyone managed to code a letter successfully. I wish we had a share your screen option, or I would probably use too much bandwidth, but it would be amazing to know if anyone was successful with coding at least a, a couple points of their letters. It's a little tricky when you have letters like S to do, um, because then you've got a lot of points to plot. Some people figure out, get a little bit creative with um, being efficient with there. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So I can return back to my slides, and you'll see um, there are so many <laughs> links for you on here. I don't know, Trish, maybe they're not having a good time with like, coding initials, or <laughs> everyone's a little quiet about it. <sighs> or they're stuck. <laughs> Okay, so you can see I have, um, it does take a while to to do this. You're working hard, Stacey. I'm glad to hear. You're always working hard, Stacey. <laughs> so um, moving on to this next slide, we've got uh, an example that I took from Dr. Yanez's book. So um, you can check out the book if you want to. Um, it's not very expensive. It's on masterprise.com. I've indicated the link there. But the one we're going to do right now is the one Trish has posted in the window, um, Scratch Random Pairs. Make sure you have your volume turned up. It's a fun one. So we're going to do the Scratch Random Pairs one now, so the, the first one that Trish has posted. And I'm going to share my screen for this one um, just to give you a couple ideas. So again, make sure your volume's turned up. Click on the green flag and see what happens and investigate the code there. I finally got the sharing screen thing mastered, Trish. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to make my code a little bit bigger so you can see it. And you can see, once again, I've put comments in the window. And I find that guides students along, especially if students, <laughs> um, got, um, especially if students um, need guidance when they're finished and you don't have to wait, they don't have to sit there with their hand up, what can I do next? There's always something more to, for them to do. My goal would be for the students to finish the first task, which is can you spread the plotted points out? Um, and then some students will start to add more points. You'll always have that student and maybe one of you doing this where you add like a thousand um, balls to your <laughs> plotted points. Uh, so it's kind of fun. And you can move all of the plotted points to a different, can you move them all to a different quadrant? So you'll we'll run the program and you see your popping. You might be able to hear my screen, I'm not sure. Uh, but so your plan then is can you spread the points out? And I'm not sure if you guys can see this, the chat window at the same time right now as I can, um, but I'm wondering if you can let me know what you did to plot, the, to spread the points out, or what you might do. So you can see right now they're in between 0 and 100 for x, and then 0 and 100 for y. The range is only in the first. Awesome. Thanks, Shannon. So you can see it's only in the first quadrant. Awesome. So can you spread them out? It's only in one small part of the first quadrant as well. So I'm going to play around with that. So what the students typically do is they change the, and probably um, what most teachers here did today, you change the, the, one, the range. So a lot of students will do 0 to 200 first for both of them. So y only goes up to 180, as you might see on your screen. So I'm going to do 0 to 180, and I'll run it again. And then you'll see that the points are spread out more. But in order to spread them to the other quadrants, the students will start to realize, oh, wait, it's still only in quadrant one. What can I do? And they'll realize that they need to change it to negative numbers um, for your range as well. So we've got negative 180 here. So I'm going to run it. And now it's spread out. Um, now, to make more balls, you might have realized that you can change the number of repeats. So I'm going to change mine to, um, to, 50, to 40. 
and I'll run it again. And then you have the option of adding more bulk. And then another thing that you can do <laughs> is change it so that all the balls have to go into one of the other quadrants. So you can say, can you move multiple quadrant two, three, and four? So it's just kind of a fun challenge. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen to show you uh, the next thing here. Okay, so what you're seeing is it's a dynamic piece of software and that the students are actually creating because when you're coding, you're making software and you're getting that immediate feedback and students appreciate that and they, it keeps them motivated because they see right away when they've made a mistake and they'll fix it. And um, if they ever make a mistake to the point where they their program doesn't really look like it was originally, they can always just go to the link again and start over. So for this one here, we're just going to have a look at my screen. You can see it's a modified version of that first one where we plotted points randomly. In this example here, we're plotting the points um, to show negative correlation. So for, I think I can use my little hand here to show you a couple things. Okay. So you can see um, at first, I start the ball in 0, 0, but then I do something similar to what I did with that other program. Um, and again, this is taken from coding for um, young mathematicians. I can't take credit for this cool program. Um, but what we have here is a variable called first number, and it's equal to a random number between 1 and 100. Then I have here um, the second number is equal to 100 minus whatever the first number is. So if your first number, um, I'm just going to try and grab a marker here, please. If your first number was, say, 60, so that's your x value, then your y value is going to be 100 minus 60, so it's going to be 40. So the next random number, let's say the next random number is 20 for x, then it's going to be 100 minus, oops, I guess I made it to 20, it's an easier number, so I've got 100 minus 20, so that gives us 80. So then you plot the points 40, 60, 20, 80, and that's what this is doing, and it does that with 10 different um, pairs of points. So a good challenge for your students for this one then would be, can you make it a positive correlation? And of course, you want to give it a real life application and say to the students, okay, this shows a negative correlation. Can you give me something in real life that would be a negative correlation? Maybe they'll say um, draining the bathtub or um, maybe they'll give you a positive correlation real-life example. So it's always important, of course, to have those real-life examples. Now, what I have had students do um, is, in high school, they've taken that program that I just showed you, and then they do the quadratics. So they actually take that program and manage to graph a parabola, which I thought was pretty cool. It, it took a little bit to get there, um, but there is a way that you can do it. So you can do some grade 9 math in there as well. So there's ways to extend it, and your students who, yeah, maybe you're teaching grades um, four to eight, uh, but some students will be ready to move on to a quadratic. So you can say to them, you know what, there's something called a parabola, can you look that up and try and change the graph to make that, and you'll be surprised. As my um, oldest son has said to me once, um, he thinks that adults sometimes underestimate what children can do, and uh, I always keep that in mind when I think, oh, maybe that will be too hard for people. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. I'm glad, to, I'm glad you get that. Okay, so here's something that you can try um, with your students if you want. We're not going to do this one tonight, but it's an idea for you to be aware of. Um, some of you have maybe been on um, one of the webinars that I've done, or you can check it out, Get Into Coding Shape, I think with Scratch is what it's called, so a past webinar. And what we did was, um, or what I did is we, we learned about having, making um, shapes. So to make a triangle is a certain way to code it. Um, you can do it with what Seymour Papert would call turtle geometry and, and so on, a square and the sun. And then in between each shape, you would put your pen up. You can also see that I use something called functions, so make blocks. That's why you can um, do that. That's a really, like, go under more blocks and make a block. It's a really neat way to break up your program, so it's not one long, giant script. But in between each shape, you put the pen up, and then you use the go to block to go to different points on the screen. So you're using Cartesian planes to, um, to move your shape to different points on the screen, and then your students there can kind of make some sort of artwork. So it's kind of a neat idea to incorporate that. Um, so Jan says, making it look like popcorn out of a hot air <laughs> popper might be fun. Yes, so many creative things. I, I think that would be great. Awesome. 
Oh, good to hear that you've tried that out. Okay, so for the next one, this is one that I'm, I'm going to um, show you. There's an article on TVO Teach Ontario that, that you can check out, and the link I'll give to you, um, or at the end you can grab that Teach Ontario link if you want to. And it's an article describing how it's a wonderful idea to give your students um, meaningful context for learning to code. Um, so for this one here, if you go to the article, it talks about how, you know what, everyone's into the Olympics right now, as Scott brought up earlier. Um, so why not do something with the Olympics in math class? The Olympics can be extended to pretty much every subject area. So you can talk a, about, you know, the history of um, different countries, cultures. You can talk about um, sports. You can talk about how to calculate speed and compare speeds, things like that. So for that article, that's what I'm talking about. So then I give you a practical example. So I, I wrote this article with my husband, Steve. And um, if you go to the first link, it's a program um, that I don't give, I wouldn't give to the students, but I'd like you to see it um, so, so you can see what the answer would be. Um, and this one is not that creative. However, some other people have made some pretty cool creative ones. So the day that I posted, it happened to be a snow day or the next day, actually. And um, Katrina Brown of Penn Valley District School Board shared what her students did with it. So they made the Olympic coding ring. So they coded a circle. They had to lift their pen up and use the go to x, y value block to move the circles around. They also added the Olympic fanfare, so they added some music to it. And then they added um, some speech bubbles talking a little bit about the Olympics as well. So, you know, maybe your students can say, this is the blue ring. It represents whatever. And then they can go through that and explain that to you, which I think is um, an activity that would take a couple of days, maybe, depending on the amount of time you have. Uh, I do see it as being valuable. Now, if you're not sure how to do that, I'm going to um, just share my screen to show you that I have this option. So the second link that Trish posted there, um, actually, I'll go to that. And then I'll share my screen. So you can click on the link yourself, or um, I will share it here as well. Oh, I see that you guys are in it. So <laughs> just making sure my screen's being shared properly. Waiting for the share. Oh, because I didn't click on share desktop yet. There we go. Okay, so yeah, you can see um, that I give you like a just a label diagram of the Scratch environment. So this would be what you could give your students. And you could, um, as I recommend in the article, you could actually just cut out different parts of this and maybe wait to see that what they need help with and give them certain different cards. Um, so if you scroll down, you can see it shows you how to code a circle. I have a YouTube video um, of myself just explaining how to make a circle in Scratch. Uh, I show you that, you know, if you want to move to different parts on the screen, you use the go to X, Y block, pen down, pen up, um, how to change the color, how to change the pen size for the thickness, and then there's some other challenges that your students will do. There's always extra challenges. There's so many extensions you can do with every program that you make. So hopefully that gives you a few ideas um, for coding the Olympics, and there's still time to do that. As you know, maybe you'll throw in um, some national anthems there as well. Okay, so for this next one, um, this is just going to be a demo. So I'm going to share my screen for you to show something that I've done. Now this is a little bit more advanced because I'm using something called lists. So anyone who's familiar with programming might have heard of the term arrays, and you can make paired lists. Um, this would be called a parallel list. Uh, and for newbies, perhaps it's more just a chance to explore the code. So right now I'm just going to demo it for you, but at the end of this webinar, uh, you will have a link to this code so that if you want to share it with your students and say, hey, can you guys figure out what this is? Um, uh, let me make sure that I actually have the, that one ready to go for you. Oops, sorry. I think I can type it in. Okay, here we go. Plot list. Plot <laughs> list. I love having um, bit.ly. I love using bit.ly. So if you log into bit.ly, you can make your own unique bit.ly bit.ly links for your students. 
So I give you the instructions here. It's probably hard to see on your screen, but it says enter the number of points you would like to plot, enter each xy coordinate, and I recommend that there be under 200. And after you've entered each point, they will be plotted. So I'll make the code a little bit bigger, so maybe you can see. Let's try for one more. Okay. And when I run it, so I showed this on a previous webinar. So how many points would you like to plot? Let's say I'm going to plot three points x coordinate of the first um, point. So I'm going to enter 100 for my x, 100 for my y. My next point, I'm going to enter in 120 and 150. And my next point, I'll enter in 50 and 50. And then I will press enter, and it's going to plot the three points. So right away, you can see where the point lands. Um, and it's kind of a neat way to check their understanding. So if you can give them a piece of paper, they plot some points, you can then have them run this program to check the points that they, they are in the general, proper, correct area. So you're welcome to check that program out afterwards at the end of the webinar. I'm just checking the time here. OK, we're doing OK. Don't want to keep you past the scheduled time. Okay, so for this next one, I'm going to walk you through moving a character around the screen. And there's so much benefit to this because um, I talk a lot about how um, it's so important to code with a purpose and, and also to learn math for an, for an authentic purpose. And so a great real-life application of using mathematics and using the Cartesian plane is in computer science. It's a perfect application of the coordinate system because when we're moving characters around the screen, when pro computer programmers need to move characters around the screen, they're, used, they're performing translations on a character. So they're moving characters by changing the x, y values. So for example, when you switch um, an x value or when you subtract 10 from an x value, you're going to the left. When you add something to the x value, you go to the right. When you add to the y value, you move up. When you subtract from the y value, you move down. Um, also, if you think about in those retro programs where you have a little character and you get to the edge of the screen, and then it looks like it wraps around and comes and appears back on the left-hand side of the screen or the opposite side, um, same as when you move down, it appears on the top. All they're doing is translating that character. So they, if you're moving from right to left, if you go to the right of the screen and you've gone too far, you just um, keep your y value and then change the x to get it to the other side. If you move down, then you keep your x value and change the y up to make it to the other side. So um, if you're following me there, we're doing some translations. So um, what I was going to do is have you code that. I'm just going to check the, the time of what I've got left. Um, what I'll have you do is we'll code one um, direction right now. I think there's enough time to do that. So we're going to, I'll share my screen. You're going to go to File New. So you're going to start a new program. So I'm going to go to File New to start a new program. And we're going to make it so the little scratch character, and some of you might have done this already. Um, we're going to make it so the little scratch character can move around the screen. So what I'm going to do there. Sorry. I'm going to go to Events, and I'm going to grab the When the Space Bar is Clicked button. So Events, When the Space is Clicked. I'm also going to go to Motion, so Events, When the Space is Clicked. Now, I'm going to change it, though. Instead of Space, let's go to the left, OK? So to do it the left, we're going to change it to Left Arrow. So we are coding it so your left arrow on your keyboard will make the character move to the left. So let's see if we can do that together. So we're going to go to motion and um, change x by. So scroll down, you'll see a change x by 10. So if I click the left arrow now, notice he's going to the right. Well, he's going to the right because we're going in a positive um, 10 direction. Let's change it to minus 10 now. And then when I click the left arrow, so you can test it on your keyboard, he'll move to the left. So you would use those other blocks, um, like change y by um, 
and you would use, so you'd change y by negative 10 and 10 to move up and down, and change x by negative 10 and 10 to move left and right. And that is how characters are programmed in video games. Um, also, I'm going to show you right now how to get that backdrop. So if you go to new backdrop on the bottom left here, the backdrops will come up. And if you scroll down, I know my screen's a little bit slow there, you're going to go to the third last one. So the third last grid, and then click on OK. Now to get back to your script, you'll just click on the scripts tab just beside the stop sign there, the stopping the program, and your, your code will come back. But right now we're still selected on the backdrop, and so what you want to do is just click on the cat. And there you've got your cat there. Again, so you can see the code. So what you would do then is go to events, add another one space is clicked, change the arrow. For doing the up arrow, you would do change Y by 10. And then you've got to working arrow. So hopefully, um, maybe by tomorrow, you'll have characters moving around your screens, and maybe your students can, can learn to do that as well. OK, I'm going to return back to my screen now just to show you something else. Okay, so for this next one, I am demonstrating something once again. So this is just a demo, uh, but again, you will have access to this program afterwards. And it's called, um, we're moving a heart around. I thought for Valentine's Day, so we did the Olympics so far. Now we're doing Valentine's Day, since tomorrow is Valentine's Day. I'm hoping my husband is helping my, my children make their Valentines as I speak, <laughs> or, or maybe putting them to bed. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to click on, I think here it is. So this is my little heart program. When I run the program, when I um, click um, different arrows, so I can move my heart around. So you'll see a different kind of grid, and I got that from the backdrop menu. When I move my heart around, um, it goes to each coordinate. If I press the space bar, it will tell me the coordinates that it's at. So that's at 120, 100, um, and then it stops. It also stamps the heart. So I'm stamping my heart at different locations. So your students can have some fun playing with that. Um, and then they can also, instead of using the heart, um, because not everyone will be happy with the heart, they can try out different programs. Uh, you can even have them grid, um, plot it on paper first and then plot it on the actual program. So another one that I'm going to show you, and I think it's best if I show you uh, my the slides again quickly. So for this program, um, I talked earlier about the option, um, I mentioned it to Elizabeth, that you can do a reflection on the X and the Y axis. And um, so this is right out of the uh, grade um, 8 curriculum. So what you can do here, just getting mine up, there we go. Um, so you can see that I've got three points. I've made a triangle. I've got A, B, and C. So right now, A is at coordinates 150 and 48. B is at 100 and then 48. And C is at 100, 100. So you see that in my code, it goes to, but this is the, the reflection. So what the reflection is going to do, uh, I have to show you my code, actual code on the screen. So I'm going to do that now. Okay, here's my code, and again, you'll have access to this after. So let's have a look at the original code. So we can see that the go to X, C, Y, C, so that um, we're going to start at that point. And if you look higher up, it's a little tricky maybe for you to see, but I've declared variables. So I have um, X, C, and Y, C is the, the C point, X, A, and Y, A is the A point, and then you've got the B point. So XC and YC is 100, 100. So it's going to 100, 100, because I've set it equal to that up the top part in my variable values. So this is more advanced, <laughs> as you probably have picked up, but it's just showing you the potential and what you can do with these programs. So if you maybe code with your students for um, a couple months, maybe next year you'll be ready to try something like this out, or maybe sooner. just depends on um, your preference and your comfort, comfort level. So when I hit the green flag, 
it's going to draw my triangle because I've used the glide and I have my pen down. Well, let's do the reflection on um, the x-axis next. So for the, if you want to go to the x-axis, I'm going to actually click on the letter x to do that. So let's have a look at the x-axis. What it does is it takes the original xc value, which is 100, and then it's going to multiply, so it's flipping the sign of the y values. So all of the y values, as you can see on my screen, are multiplied by something. What they're multiplied by is if you look at the, the variable called y translate, it's a little small, make it bigger on your screen, you can see it's equal to negative 1. So that when you multiply a positive value by a negative number, it ends up with a negative number. So we have the y value now becomes negative. So when you plot it, it flips over to the x-axis. Now if we um, can go ahead and do that for the y-axis as well, I'm going to do that now. So I hit y. Maybe I have to run it again. Whoops, I hit something at the same time. Well, that's cool. <laughs> Okay, we'll clear that. There we go. So here's my first one. Now I'm going to hit the Y to get it to plot across um, the Y, the reflection on the Y axis. And for that one, it's very similar to the other code. It actually didn't take very long to make. I just duplicated and switched things around a little bit. I multiplied my X values by negative 1, and that flips them over. So the kind of a neat... Um, demo. You can even have your students just play around with the program, try and understand what the heck is happening there. Okay, so finally, um, this last demo before I show you the grand finale program, which is kind of a funny game that I made for you to, to experiment with. Um, we're going to have a look at um, a circle of hearts. I'm just going to read what Barb mentioned. I um, really like the Cartesian playing work with transformations. Yes, it's um, pretty awesome. So for grade seven, eight, that that really it's good to hear. And oh yeah, we can make dilation, um, so we can make um, characters, scratch characters, bigger or smaller, or you can have them code shapes and replot them um, with a bigger size. So let's check out the circle of hearts demo. My last demo of the night before I just share with you one more link to try out. After this, we'll try out a little biathlon link that I attempted to code. So I really, really like this program. Um, I made it, it was inspired by um, a couple speakers, by um, Hoyles and Noss at a coding and computational thinking um, symposium, a math symposium. That was held at Western in 2015, I believe. I had the privilege to listen to them. They have been doing a math project in England, or they worked on it last year where they were coding with students in math class and then testing to see how um, their math skills improved from the coding. Now, what this program does, so I'm just going to run it and then I will talk a little bit about it. So I'm going to run it and I think it's kind of cool. I'm going to, I can just see what it looks like on your screen at home. I'm going to try clicking on it again. There we go. So you can see the hearts are flying. It's a little delayed, but they do gradually move to the edge of the circle. Now, if you look at the code, the, the first repeat says 75. So there are 75 hearts that are being plotted. What's kind of neat about it is usually we think of a circle as moving in a circle. We forget that, um, that it actually is important to talk about the radius. And if, so what these hearts are doing is they're starting in the center of the circle at 0, 0 then they're moving in a random direction, and it's either it's between 0 and 360 degrees. So they're either moving 5 degrees, 60 degrees, and so on. So they're all moving in random directions. The clone means it's making a copy of itself, and then once it's a copy of itself, it then goes and moves in the random direction. So it actually just sets the random direction at first, then it points in the random direction, and then it moves. So the amount it moves, so if you notice here, I have a repeat of 10. The radius is set to 15 right now, and it's going to move radius steps. But because I'm moving it, um, I'm doing that 10 times, it moves 15 steps, and it repeats that 10 times, and then it finally ends at the edge of the circle, which is at is 150. So my radius there is 150. Um, now if I were to take that out and just leave this one in, there we go. 
Um, so the reason I used the repeat was to slow it down so the students can actually see the hearts moving. It just kind of looks prettier, I think. But um, we can try this one. So this one has a radius of 100. Uh, and then if I change it to um, 50, so I'm going to change my radius value to 50 and run it again, really gets them thinking about circles and that they have um, a point in the middle and then the, the radius and then the random direction, you end up with a circumference of a circle. I kind of imagine this um, being done in a gym with a bucket of like socks or something, and then the kids grab a sock or beanbag, run uh, maybe 10 meters, or you could say run approximately 10 steps, or 10 steps, hoping to aim for the same distance for each kid, and then they drop the the sock, and then they go back to the middle, grab another sock, run to the 10 steps, drop it, and they can go in random directions every time they do that. So I think that will demonstrate to the students that um, they are, I'm trying to, to stop my sharing here, but I lost my screen. Where did it go? There we go. So I'm trying to demonstrate that um, that students can construct a circle given a center and radius um, and a center or a point on the circle and then they can actually go ahead and plot it um, with at least three points. And so that is right from the grade 8 curriculum. So I just thought I would show you that kind of neat way. Yes, unplugged with socks in the gym. Thanks, Barb. Okay, so this final program of the night is actually something that it's, it's a little rough but I was trying to show you that you can do a biathlon-inspired um, program, but you can have your students do anything. This is just something simple that I made. Maybe you won't have time for your students to make a whole game in class, but maybe they will be inspired to continue their coding at home or perhaps at a club. So if you can check out this program, I'll explain it a little bit. So bit.ly slash biathlon code, and I will share it with you as well. I don't know where my, oh, I think I'm sharing with you. Oh, I am. Okay, so I'm going to click on my biathlon. So what's happening in this, and there's so many different extensions that you can do with this. So to start your program, you might have to click the green flag. So when you click the green flag, your timer will start, and then you use the arrow keys to move the little, that's a little biathlon guy, <laughs> to move him or her to, I think it's actually female that I selected there, so to move around the screen. Now if you hit the blue, the maze, which all I did for that, I was going to have you code it, but obviously it was a good idea that I didn't because it's 852 now, um, but I just went to, to backdrop and costume and then I just drew shapes on the backdrop. So I, I can maybe make a little YouTube video explaining that if you think that would be useful for you. Um, but I'm just going to show you how we can I see a hand up, so if you have a question, just let us know what's in the chat window, but you probably just click on. So you can move around, um, move your guy around. So I'm going to try that now. I'm going to move my athlete all the way to the red circle. So that's my goal, to move around the maze, which I used by, remember I showed you how to move characters around? I'm getting to that red dot, so it tells me my time, and then it's going to take me to a new backdrop, and it's time for rifle shooting. So it tells you that you have to click on the little ball so in order to have the code. So for this one, rather than um, playing the game, you're actually going to code it to make it so it will go to each individual point. So right here, I'm going to make my code a little bigger. It's a little bit confusing, but um, if you take a little time to look at it, you should be able to see that I've indicated comments by comments what you need to do. So here I changed the glide block coordinates to hit the first target. So I've already done that for you. And then it says change the glide block coordinates to hit the second target. So I think I've done that one for you as well. So let's run it and see. So I'm going to hit the space bar to run it. And then it's stamped. So I've done the first three points for you. So then your goal then would be to see if you can plot the last two. So right now you'll see that they're at zero, zero. So your goal would be to um, plot them on the two different areas there. So that would be your goal. And then once you've done that, you could um, have your students do some more time as well if you want to. And actually, you can hit the T at any time, the lowercase letter T, and it will tell you your current time. So students can see how fast they can code those last couple points. 
So again, it's kind of a, a rough game, but it's really just to get your students inspired. I'm going to stop sharing. You do have the link if you want to play it around, play around with it some more. And of course, if you have any questions at all about that program, about anything, um, I encourage you to contact me or, or write the question out in the chat window right now if you have a chance. So throughout all of this, I just want you to, to keep in mind that, um, yes, this might be all new and some of those programs might be maybe super challenging or maybe not, but they possibly were because a lot of that would be something that I um, just made recently after a couple of years of doing scratch coding with younger students. Um, I did teach computer science for a number of years, so that helps me out a little bit. Uh, but keep, consider yourself, I, I like this term, adaptive expert. So the fact that you're on this webinar tonight, the fact that you're willing to learn uh, alongside your students in many cases, shows that you're willing to be responsive to student needs. You believe that this is important for your students, you're willing to change um, the way you've been teaching and to try out some new things. Um, you're also thinking about how you can apply this to your own situations and your own students. Um, you can see here that I have a quote. Um, it's one of my favorite quotes, and you might have heard me say before if you've um, heard me talk before. Um, but I like the term, the stars are given the constellations we make. And it's amazing if we can use platforms that allow us to do this sort of thing. It's amazing if you can use code.org. Um, it's even better if you can use Scratch because you're actually having the students code um, really cool, creative things um, while they learn along the way. Um, in this case, we're showing them how to plot points, how to do translations and maybe reflections if you're feeling that you're ready for that. Um, but you're challenging them to be creative once you've given them the basic tools. So it's awesome if you can give your students the basic tools and then challenge them to be creative rather than just say, go do it, which maybe you'll do the first couple times when you're coding with your students, but it's better to at least give them some way to inspire uh, or something to inspire them with. So thank you so much uh, for joining me this, this evening. Um, again, if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to email me. I'll answer a couple, I see a couple of comments or questions in there right now. Um, also on DM, it's Lisa Ann Floyd um, with an E. You can DM me or, or tweet at me during the day. It's always fun if someone has a bug in a program or a student does. Um, you can send it to me via Twitter. And if I don't get to it, I'm sure someone else that would um, when they see it. And all the resources from today, I know that um, OTS, which just usually will post all of the resources um, once the actual recording is available. So you can watch the recording again if you'd like. Um, but the, the link to all the resources that I just gave you tonight are on um, this uh, resource right there, which Trish has already posted in the chat window. So I'll pass it back over. Actually, I'm just going to read a couple questions here. <laughs> How did you leave instructions activity prompts beside the script? Oh, and I see that Scott answered. Thank you. So yeah, you could right click. If you can't right click in the browser you're using, you can use shift and regular click. And then the comments um, option will come up. And the Ziza needs more time to practice. Yes, um, and that's common. We all do. And can you share your slides? Thank you. OK. So you can see that all the, the links from my slides are right on um, that resource there. So again, thank you for joining me, and I'll pass it back on to Trish. Wow, I agree. That was amazing. I have to say that was probably the fastest um, hour and a half I've had in a long time. Whew. My goodness. So uh, I get the wonderful job of saying thanks to Lisa and asking for your feedback. I've got a uh, feedback link for you right there. And let's see if I can pop one into the slideshow too. So you can click anywhere you'd like. Yes, I agree, Scott. Lisa's so knowledgeable. I'm going to uh, just mention a few more things while you're doing that feedback. Just a reminder that there are, are AQ courses that are still available. Check them out. You get that redemption from OTF. And uh, I'm going to put it back on her resources page here. So if you need to, climb back up in the chat to see the uh, links and everything else that are there. I'm going to stop the recording right now, but uh, some of you might have some questions for Lisa, and uh, you're welcome to stick around for a minute. Otherwise, as you do the feedback, remember to close the window and once you're done, and uh, you'll get your certificate. So I'm just going to stop the recording now.